Good morning. Welcome to worship, everyone, whether you are worshiping with us in person or online. It is great that we can worship our great and wonderful Father. And today we're thinking about the forgiveness that Jesus gives to us and what that means for us. Let's begin our time of worship in prayer. Gracious Lord, every moment of our lives is a time of worship, but we thank you that we can gather with our sisters and brothers and worship you together. And so we pray, Lord, that if there's anything that might uh, distract us from you and what you have for us today in our worship together, we pray that you would help us to set that aside, to place that into your loving care. And then we ask, Lord, that as you pour your love into our hearts, you would help us to respond to you with worship and praise and adoration for you with our entire being. In the holy and precious and matchless name of Jesus, we ask this, and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. We invite you to stand for the first song. Great is your faithfulness, O oh God. Free! 
simple song of love to my Savior, to my Jesus. I'm grateful for the things you've done, my loving Savior, my precious Jesus. My heart is glad that you've called me your own. There's no place I'd rather be than in your arms of love. In your we thank you for calling us your own and for loving us so very much. Draw us closer to you and remind us by your spirit that in you we are free. Who am I that the highest king would was lost, but he brought me in, oh, his love for me, oh, his love for me, who oh, the sun sets free, oh, is free indeed, I'm a child. Some is grace and 
Please be seated. Today's first reading is from Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 to 14. Since then, you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on earthly things. For you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived, but now you must also rid yourselves of all such things as these, anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other, since you have taken off your old self with, these, with its practices, and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator. Here there is no Gentile or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourself with compassion kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another if any of you has a grievance against someone. Forgive as the Lord forgave you, and over all these virtues put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Today's second reading is from John chapter 8, verses 2 to 11. At dawn he appeared again in the temple courts, where all the people gathered around him and sat down to teach them. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery. They made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery, and the law of Moses commands us to stone such women. Now what do you say? They were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him. But Jesus bent down and started writing on the ground with his finger. When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, Let any one of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. Again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. At this, those who heard began to go away one at a time, the older ones first, until only Jesus was left with the women still standing there. Jesus straightened up and asked her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Go now and leave your life of sin. So good morning. Today I want to talk about forgiveness. And... Uh, I've done this children's lesson before, but it's a family favorite, so I'm gonna do it again. Um, I'm gonna talk about bananas. So this is kind of how I'm actually feeling today, just a little bit worn out, perhaps not like I'm the best person in the world. Maybe I argue with my family or interfere and do things, and I'm kind of feeling like this, you know? And then what happens is sometimes all those feelings, they get a little bit exposed. And do you know what happens when your banana is exposed? It doesn't look very good, does it? And then you know what I do? I try to fix it myself. So I might try and do this, and then, I don't know, I'm going to cover it up. You know, maybe say, well, I was really tired today, so it's not my fault that I was like that. And so there. I think it's better, aren't I? But you know, I, I don't think it's quite better, so maybe sometimes, well, I'm getting old and life is hard, so I'm gonna try and maybe staple it shut because that will be better, you know? A little bit of, you should feel sorry for me, the pain I'm causing, and 
Oh, I can't even get my stapler on there. I don't know, it's not working. Oh, there it is. I think it's looking worse, but you know what? That's okay, because I have more. I have an elastic band, because that'll work. Ooh. What do you think now? Have I looked like the good banana? I'm still, I've got more to ways to fix it. I could glue it, because we know that things like sticking it together, like, hey, come on, everyone, be like me, be like me. I can't even get the glue stick lid off. Let's go, oh, look. What do you think? Did I fix my problems? No. Can I fix my own problems? No. I can't, actually. I'm never, oh. <laughs> I am never going to look like that good banana again on my own. I need to ask God for forgiveness. Often I need to ask other people for forgiveness. And the really good thing that the Bible promises us is that through Jesus, this one is perfect, don't you agree? A little bit of green at the top, just the right color. I know. And you know what? This is how God makes us. Through his dying on the cross, rising again. We're going to celebrate that at Easter. But in this season, we think of how we need him and how he takes us from whatever that was to this. Let's have a prayer, and then if you're wanting to, we have Sunday school today. If you want to stay here, this is for children. If you want to stay here, there's some coloring pages. Dear God, we are not perfect people, and we sin, and we live lives that are not pleasing uh, to others around us and to you, but we know that you forgive us. We need to ask for forgiveness. And we know that you are there to always forgive us and make us a new person. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Just a few announcements uh, as uh, uh, we continue our worship service. First of all, uh, I'm sure all of you are aware about the crisis in Ukraine caused by the war there. Uh, Canadian Lutheran World Relief has set up a special fund to help families that have been displaced by the war, and you can give to that fund at clwr.org slash Ukraine. Uh, Lutheran Church Canada has also set up a special fund because uh, the Lutheran pastors in the Ukraine have sent their uh, families, their wives and their children to other countries in Europe to be safe, and they've stayed behind to serve the people. And uh, you can give to that fund to help them uh, and also help them as they help others at LutheranChurchCanada.ca. I want to thank some very special people. Uh, I want to thank uh, Denise and her music team. They have been serving us for 15 years, faithfully leading us in worship, and uh, their group has uh, decided to disband. Uh, so we want to thank them, Denise, Ron, Jane, Laura, Dolores, and Kevin. And uh, we also want to thank Duncan for serving as our manager of worship for the past four years. So let's thank them with a round of applause, shall we? Uh, we'll also be praying for them in our prayers today. Thank you to everyone who... Uh, helped out with the spring cleanup yesterday. Also, uh, you'll find sermon notes on our church app. I said this last week, but they weren't there because I forgot to put the proper thing in the right place, but they're there now. And also there's a Bible study that goes along with the sermon on our church app as well. You can use that in your small group or in your um, family uh, Bible study or in your personal devotion time. This morning, we're going to be doing some things differently in our worship service. I'll be giving more instructions later on, but what you need to know right now is you're going to need a rock. So there was rocks on a table for you to pick up on your way in. Uh, there's also a few rocks on a small table at the back of our worship space. Uh, this is for our confession time that we're going to have later on. And uh, there's different sizes. It doesn't matter what size you pick up. Uh, but I invite you to get a rock sometime uh, before the end of 
the sermon. And at this time, I'd like to invite uh, Kathleen to come up for a special announcement. Uh, good morning, everyone. I just wanted to let you guys know of uh, our youth group is going to be having a fundraiser coming up in April. Uh, we're going to be doing a silent auction. It's going to include a talent show, some coffee, cookies, some baking. Um, and so we want to invite everyone out there, whether you're connected to our youth group uh, with your students or not, uh, everybody is welcome. We want to uh, have everyone out. That'll be on April 7th at 6.30 at the church. And so uh, what we're fundraising for is at the end of April, we're going to be taking our students to Camp Luther for a weekend retreat uh, for the first time in like two years since COVID. So everyone is very, very excited for that. Uh, and we want to bring the cost down for that. Right now it's about $130 a student to go. And so through the fundraiser, we want to bring that cost down just to make it as affordable as possible for everyone. And so, yeah, we would love it if uh, you guys could come out. If you have donations that you want to bring to the silent auction, that would be uh, amazing too. And so we just want to make this a super fun event uh, for everyone. So, yeah, thank you. Here at Walnut Grove Lutheran Church, we want to be a church that helps people of all generations to be passionate about, equipped for, and effective at transforming lives for the kingdom of God. And we uh, not only want to do that within our church, but we want to be a church that helps other churches to grow in making disciples who make disciples. So if you would like to join with us, partner with us financially in this mission that God has given to us, uh, you can do so by giving online at wglc.org slash donate. Or if you want to set up an ongoing giving relationship with us, if you haven't done that yet, uh, you can do so by emailing our office at admin at wglc.org. And if you brought you, your uh, offering with you today, uh, there's a basket on the side table over there. You could drop it in there uh, as you exit our worship space. Things will be in a little bit different order this morning. Uh, so at this time, I invite you to stand and let us confess the faith that we share together in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead, he ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From there, he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let's pray. Gracious and loving Lord, we lift up to you our broken and hurting world. And we pray for the people of Ukraine who are suffering and grieving so terribly these days because of the war there. We pray, Lord, that in a way which only you can make happen, that you would bring the war to an end and that you would establish peace and that you would comfort those who are grieving and heal those who are wounded and protect those in danger and comfort the fearful hearts that are in Ukraine and around the world. Lord, there are things happening in the world that are beyond our control. But we know that you hold the entire cosmos in your loving care. And so we pray, dear Lord, that you would bring peace to Ukraine and that you would do so soon. We pray for all refugees, those from Ukraine and elsewhere in the world. And today we especially pray for the Tariq family, Tariq, Shazia, Irene, Sarah, Simon, and Solomon. 
And we ask, Lord, that you would protect them and keep them safe and healthy and give them comfort and patience and courage and strength as they and us wait for the day when they can, uh, when they can come to Canada and we can help them to begin a new life here. And so we've asked that you'd be preparing us and them for that day, and we pray that it would happen soon. We pray, Lord, uh, that you would continue to guide all government and health uh, leaders as the uh, response to the pandemic uh, continues. We thank you, Lord, that there is um, some of the restrictions have been lifted. We thank you. Um, that this has happened, but we pray that you would help us to always be mindful of you and uh, your presence in the world and that uh, our freedom is not based on what we can and cannot do, but it's based on you. And so we pray that you would help us to be uh, people of love and grace and, uh, and mercy <clears throat> as uh, the future unfolds uh, and it's unknown to us exactly how that will happen. But we know that you hold the future in your hands. Lord, we pray a prayer of thanksgiving for all of our talented and dedicated volunteers. Uh, we especially pray a prayer of thanks for Denise and her team, for Denise, Ron, Jane, Laura, Dolores, and Kevin. We thank you for the way that they have led us in worship and, and served so faithfully over these past 15 years. And we pray that you would Bless them in all of their future endeavors. We thank you, Lord, also for Duncan, who has faithfully served as our manager of worship for the past four years. Thank you for the blessing that he has been. And uh, we pray that you would bless him as he serves in other ways uh, in our church. We lift up one of our neighboring churches in the Lower Mainland, the Village Church, as their pastor, Mark Clark, moves to serve as a pastor at... Uh, Bay Ridge Church in Sacramento, California. Uh, we pray that you would continue to be with the people of the village uh, and that you would continue to provide what they need as they seek to reach uh, people with uh, the good news of forgiveness and salvation uh, through Jesus Christ. And we pray that you would uh, raise up just the right leaders that they need to continue doing the work that you are calling them to do. We pray for all who are sharing the good news of Jesus Christ throughout the world. Uh, we especially pray for the Lutheran pastors in Ukraine. We ask that you watch over them, protect them, and keep them safe. We also pray for uh, Reverend uh, Maximo Moroman uh, Yoros, who is a missionary pastor serving the community of uh, Pita Hinotepe in Nicaragua. And we ask that you bless Pastor Yoros that you watch over him and you keep him safe, that you provide what he needs to do the work you're calling him to do, and that you would uh, bless him, we pray. We pray for all those who are grieving. We lift up to you Rhonda Kay and her family who are grieving the loss of her grandma. Pray for me and my family as we grieve the loss of my Auntie Elner, and for Victor and his family who are grieving the death of his uncle Manuel. We pray for Lynn T, who is grieving the death of her sister, uh, Yip, and also for Ryan and his family as they grieve the death of his father. And we lift up to you all others who are grieving, and we now name them in our hearts before you. Dear Jesus, we thank you for dying for us on the cross and rising again to give us the sure and certain promise of resurrection life. And we pray that you would wrap your arms of love around all who are grieving and comfort them with your presence and your promise of life eternal with you. We pray for all who are going through a difficult time right now and need your rest, comfort, encouragement, and strength. We lift up to you Earl and Marion and their family and also Otto and Shauna. And we ask, Lord, that you would be with them in a special way and strengthen them with your presence. We pray for all who are in need of your healing touch. 
for Rita E, who is in hospital recovering from COVID and then will need to move to long-term care home when she's released. We pray for Rachel, who's dealing with ALS. And Maddie, we thank you, Lord, that he's able to come home and pray that you would continue to bring healing into his life as he continues his recovery there. We pray for Corey P., who has serious health challenges, and others who need your healing touch, including Bryant G.'s dad, Lori, Clarissa's dad, Bob J., Jody C., Glenn P., Elizabeth P., Julianne L., Pastor Carl, Lynn, and Ruth H. And for all others who need your healing, we now name in our hearts before you in silent prayer. Dear Lord, you are the great physician and the source of all healing whenever it happens. And so we pray that you would strengthen our loved ones both in body and in spirit and help them to know that you are always with them, that you always love them, and that they are forever safe with you. We pray for our church that you would guide us in how we can best reach out to the people around us with your life-giving love. And we pray, Lord, for your blessing upon the BC Mission Boat team that is leaving uh, today to go to Hadassat for a few days. Uh, bless Rhonda and Julie and Helmut and Mitch. Uh, watch over them and keep them safe. And uh, we pray that as they serve, they would not only be blessed, but they would be a blessing to the people of Hadassat. Lord, we pray all of our spoken and silent prayers in Jesus' name, and we pray as he has taught us, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated. Gracious Lord, what a great and wonderful thing it is that you speak to us through your word. And as we reflect on your word this morning, we pray that you would help us to hear what it is that you are saying to each one of us. We ask that you would plant your word deep in our hearts and help us to live by it. For you indeed have the words of eternal life. In your precious and holy and matchless name we ask this. And everyone said... Oh, man. Well, welcome to day 13 of the Red Letter Challenge. Uh, this past week, we're focusing on what it means to be with Jesus, and some of us were engaged in spirit, spiritual practices like reading the Bible, praying, fasting, and celebrating. Uh, today, we're going to kick off our focus on the second target, which Jesus has given to us to aim at as we follow him through life, and that is forgiving. Now, I don't know how things go at your house, but at our house, we have several remotes for our TV in the living room. And invariably, at some point, one of them goes missing. And then what has to happen, at least in our house, and I'm sad to say this, is somebody has to go looking in the couch for the remote control. And that's a dangerous job. Like, there's, there's hazards in there. So let me uh, just uh, take a look what's in this couch. And uh, all of these things have come from a Paul Guard couch at one point or another. So uh, we have in here some uh, popcorn. And uh, there are some pencil. And uh, there's a sock. And, uh, oh, some Christmas decorations, nice. And fingernail clippers. 
and uh, uh, some uh, elastic hair bands, and uh, two lips. And if you're really lucky, you might, but not always, find the remote. It's a great day when you can find the remote. Harmony returns to the home. And the point of it is that life is kind of like a couch. We look good on the outside, but when you dig underneath the cushions, you find all kinds of nasty things that are hidden there. We've all got things in our past that we've said, thought, or done, and we regret them. We regret them and we carry around with us a load of guilt and shame because of those things, so we keep them hidden. We don't want other people to see our junk. And we develop coping mechanisms uh, to try and work around what guilt and shame we may feel. But those behavior patterns really don't help. They only tighten the grip of that of, uh, bondage that our hidden past has on us. And so there's a lot going on beneath the cushions of our lives. Would we, can we agree on that? Would that be a safe thing to say? This is an audience participation piece. So like, you can just kind of nod silently if you're comfortable with that. Now, um, what makes this hidden bondage that we carry around even worse is that it has a, a negative impact on the life we share as a community of faith. Because it's really, really easy for us to form a community based on how we look on the outside. But then what happens is when people come into our community, many of them feel like they don't fit in. Because they know that they have stains and blemishes on the inside, and all the rest of the people look like they got it all together. But if that's you, if you feel like you don't fit in because of stuff you're carrying around on the inside, let me tell you, you absolutely do fit in here at Walnut Grove Lutheran Church. Because all of us, all of us, are struggling with some kind of hurt and pain deep down. And what God wants to do today is flip the cushions on your life and mine and say, you don't have to live with that crud in your life any longer. Today it's going to be over because, this is what God is saying, I am going to rid you of your shameful past. Now, to help us get there, we're going to dig into the Bible and look at John chapter 8, verses 2 to 11. So if you have a Bible or a Bible app, I invite you to turn there now. And as you do, what you will see, uh, many of you might see, is a note in your Bible or Bible app indicating this passage was not in many of the earliest manuscripts of the Bible and therefore should not be considered part of John's Gospel. Now, please be aware that Bible scholars are not saying that the events described in this passage didn't happen. What they're saying is John probably didn't write them down. Somebody else, it seems, did and then maybe added it to John's Gospel later. However, because it does fit with what we see elsewhere in the Bible regarding who Jesus is and uh, what he said and what he did, it's proper for us to take a deep uh, look at this passage today. And what we find as we do that is Jesus is in Jerusalem for the Feast of Tabernacles. And as he often did when he was in Jerusalem, he was teaching in the temple courts to the people that were gathered there. And while Jesus is teaching, the teachers of the law and the Pharisees bring before him a woman who is caught in the act of adultery because they wanted to trap Jesus. Now let's think for a moment about what is going on here. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees are the religious leaders of God's people. And yet they conspire to set this unholy trap for Jesus because they believe that Jesus is going to undermine their religious system by teaching people that God is loving and gracious. And they're exactly right. Because this is why Jesus came. 
to show us that our personal religions of human-made rules are worthless. And Jesus offers us instead a new life filled with goodness, beauty, and truth through a relationship with God through him. Turning to our passage, we read these words. They, that is the teachers of the law and the Pharisees, made her, the woman caught in adultery, stand before the group and said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. In the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. What do you say? They were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him. Now, can you get a sense of how scandalous the situation situation was the Pharisees and the, uh, the Pharisees and the teachers of the law likely planned this trap for days maybe even weeks watching and waiting for just the right time when they could spring it and finally their opportunity comes and they catch a couple in the act of adultery and they bring the woman before Jesus now, these are the religious leaders of that society who knew of a situation where adultery was likely to happen, did nothing to prevent it, but instead allowed it to go ahead so they could use it for their purposes. And then they bring the woman, not the man, before Jesus. Like, why was that? Doesn't it take two people to commit adultery? Was the man a co-conspirator who enticed the woman to sin in this way? They bring only one person. And this woman was pulled from a bed only minutes before. She may or may not have been wearing any clothes. She was likely distraught, weeping, and fearful. And to the religious leaders, she is nothing but a useful pawn. They don't care if she lives or dies. What they want to do is trap Jesus. If he says that the woman should be stoned, then he will violate the grace that he claims God freely gives. And if he says that the woman should not be stoned, then he violates one of the Ten Commandments which God gave to his people centuries before. The trap has been set. And all these men gathered around, watch intently for Jesus to step into it. And what Jesus did instead must have been infuriating to them. We read, but Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. Can you imagine how angry those men must have been? But Jesus is showing us something important. He's showing us that we don't always need to respond to a situation in the heat of the moment. Often the best thing that we can do is to pause and reflect, taking some time to consider what is going on around us and in us instead of simply reacting. During the Cuban Missile Crisis of 1962 in October of that year, President John Kennedy would sometimes doodle on White House stationery during meetings convened to deal with the crisis. By taking a step back and considering other factors like the challenges faced by Nikita Khrushchev, the leader of the Soviet Union, and other possible courses of action instead of sending American troops to invade Cuba as was being recommended to him, Kennedy was able to lead the United States through a course of action that averted a nuclear catastrophe. How many harsh words could remain unsaid and regrettable actions remain undone if we simply take a moment to stop and pray? These men kept on badgering Jesus with questions and he kept on ignoring them. And then finally, he straightened up and said to them, let any one of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. Again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. 
Now, none of us knows what Jesus was writing on the ground that day. Various Bible scholars have speculated on what it might have been. One theory that I find interesting is that maybe Jesus was writing the names of the men that were in that circle around him and the woman. And then beside each name, he was writing their sins. Whatever it was that Jesus wrote, as he did that, one by one, they begin to leave. This passage tells us that the older men left first. Now, some people think that it's because the older men were wiser. But maybe it was because they had a longer list of sins beside their name. Those men flipped the cushions on this woman. And Jesus then flipped the cushions on the men. Eventually, only Jesus was left with the woman still standing there. Jesus straightened up and asked her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Jesus declared, Go now and leave your life of sin. The only person who could have thrown a stone at the woman chose not to. And we find the reason why earlier in John's Gospel. Perhaps the most famous verse in the Bible is John 3.16. And I invite you to say it with me, shall we? For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. But what happens is we often stop at the end of that verse and we ignore the next one, which is also very important. Because it tells us, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Jesus didn't come to condemn that woman or us. He came to save her and us and set us all free. Now it's interesting to me that John chapter 8 both begins and ends with an attempted stoning. At the beginning of the chapter, it's this woman caught in adultery who is on the verge of dying under a deluge of rocks thrown in condemnation. But at the end of the chapter, it's Jesus. And this is the way of humanity. If someone violates a belief or a rule that we believe is important to us, we reject them, toss them out of our life, and stone them in our hearts. But that's not the way of God. Yes, God has given us rules, but they are not tasks that we accomplish in order to earn his favor and our salvation. They're boundaries that mark off the perimeter of the rich, full, abundant life that he wants to give to us. God gave us those commandments not to enslave us, but because he loves us and wants us to live in freedom and enjoy life with him. The way of God is to send Jesus into the world to take care of our sin for us. And Jesus dealt with all of our sin by coming into this world, becoming one of us, and standing in our place to take the punishment that we deserve so that we could be set free. Was that woman a sinner? Yes, she was. And so are we. And Jesus has taken all the rocks that we deserve and let those blows land on him instead of us so that us broken, flawed sinners could live as beloved children of God in the freedom of Jesus' forgiveness. We tend to think that we need to clean up our lives before we come to Jesus. And yet here is this disheveled, distraught, barely dressed woman who 30 minutes prior was committing adultery, and at that time coming to Jesus was probably the furthest thing from her mind, and yet here she was. And Jesus didn't condemn her. 
he set her free. And if we can get over the hump of bringing ourselves and our sin to Jesus, then we often face a second and perhaps more tragic hurdle, and that is that we often listen to the lies and accusation of humanity's great enemy, Satan, far more than we listen to the truth of the gospel that says that Jesus came to save us and make all things right between us and him. And as a result, we carry around guilt and shame for things that God has already forgiven us for. As one of my professors would sometimes say, it's like we give all of our sins to Jesus and he throws them in a garbage truck and hauls them away. Then we go chasing after the garbage truck and try and catch it so we can get our sins back. The things that we do are so unnecessary and even ridiculous in God's eyes. And yet we do that because we don't fully understand and know God's love for us and his grace for us. The solution is not to try to do more to pay for our forgiveness. That won't solve our problem. Nor will burying our sin deeper and hoping that the truth won't come out. Won't come out. Because it always does. The solution is to flip our own cushions over and show all the garbage in our lives to Jesus so he can clean it up and take it away and we leave it with him. He already knows about all the junk in our lives, and he's already paid the full cost for all of it to be forgiven. Flipping the cushions in our lives means that we don't have to carry around the burden of our guilt anymore. Flipping the cushions means that we don't have to hide the shameful things of our past anymore. That's who we were then. That's not who we are now in Jesus. Flipping the cushions means that we're able to fully embrace the good things that Jesus has for us in the future because we are no longer bound by our past. We have let it all go. When I was about 16 or 17 years old, I got a ticket for illegal conveyance of alcohol. That's what happens when you have an open bottle of alcohol in the back of your pickup truck and you get stopped by the police. I was driving, uh, but one of the people that was riding with me said they would take care of the ticket, so I gave it to them, and I thought that was that. Now, you have to understand, I uh, grew up in a farming community that was centered around a small town of 1,500 people, and we didn't have Netflix or Disney Plus back then, And so what people would do for entertainment is they would go to the courtroom when it was in session and they would see what's going on. And then uh, the local newspaper would print a summary of everything that happened in court uh, in the local paper. So you got double your entertainment value. You could actually see it in person and read about it later on. And uh, one day... Uh, When I was in high school, uh, some friends of mine, this is about a month or so after I got the ticket, uh, some friends of mine came back from court. And what they were doing there, I do not know. But they came back to me and they said, did you know your name was read out in court today? And uh, I was having a good day before that. Uh, But that changed uh, in that moment because... uh, My secret ticket was now public knowledge, and I was filled with shame. And I knew I was going to have to tell my dad before he heard about it from someone else or read it in the local paper. And that was not a conversation I was looking forward to. But I did talk to my dad, and what he told me to do was this. He said, go get the ticket and I'll take care of it. So I got the ticket from my friend, and I gave it to him, and he took it to the local magistrate. And I never heard anything more about it. And as I think back on it now, I think what my dad did was pay my fine for the ticket, plus the penalty for late payment for me, and it all went away. 
I was guilty of breaking the law, and yet I was free because of what my dad had done for me. We live in a very divisive time. Not only is there a war going on in Ukraine, which is divided in the world into pro-Ukraine and pro-Russia camps, but our society is also sharply divided over issues such as vaccines, public health mandates, truckers, protests, etc., etc., etc. And these divisions run right through workplaces, neighborhoods, friendships, families, and churches. When I was at the Canadian Lutheran Bible Institute in uh, Camrose in January teaching a course there, the president of uh, CLBI, Dean Rostad, uh, shared something he had learned while taking a sociology course over uh, Christmas. The instructor said that many people think that the pandemic's going to be over in 2022 and then we'll be able to party. But this person said that what they think is going to happen that the, is that the pandemic will be like a flood. And we had a flood here in the lower mainland in November, so we know something of what that can be like. And when a flood recedes, that's when you see the damage that it did. And this instructor was saying, as the pandemic recedes, that's, we're going, that's when we're going to see the damage that it has done. And that it's going to take, this person was saying, another two years to repair that damage before our world can get back to, you know, normal, whatever that is, and celebrate. And I think that that instructor is correct. I think that there is going to be a lot of damage. And there's going to be a lot of healing and reconciliation that will need to be done. Now, in a few moments, we're going to have a special time of confession and forgiveness, and we're going to receive Holy Communion as part of that. But the forgiveness that Jesus gives to us is not only for the relationship that we have with him. It is also for the relationships that we have with others. And so I'm asking you to not only reflect on what Jesus' forgiveness means for you, I'm asking you to also consider what it means for others. In 2 Corinthians 5, 18 to 19, we read these words, all this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. As your pastor, I am asking you, I am even begging you to be fully reconciled to God. But I'm also asking you to be a person that takes a stand and says, I'm going to be a person who's a reconciler. Please understand, I'm not asking you to try to achieve reconciliation by compromising on truth. That's something we often see in the world around us. But as followers of Jesus, we know that truth is a person, and that person is Jesus Christ. And it's Jesus and his love and his grace that we want to represent in the world around us. Amen. Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you for reconciling us to our Heavenly Father. And we pray that by your Spirit you would help us to grow in knowing you and your love and grace for us to a fuller extent. We pray that you would give us the courage we need to flip the cushions in our own lives and show you all the junk that you already know is there but it's so we can have clear consciences and live in freedom. And oh Lord, we pray that by your love, you would help, by your spirit, you would help us to reflect your love and your grace 
and your forgiveness into the lives of the people around us. In your holy and precious name we ask this. And everyone said, Amen. So uh, today I'm inviting, yeah, thank you, Matteo. And Tim? I'm inviting all of you to join together in a special time of confessing our sins, receiving God's free and full forgiveness, and celebrating Jesus' wonderful gift of Holy Communion. And though we do not fully understand how it works, we believe that God, we believe that Jesus gives us his body and blood uh, for the forgiveness of our sins in this special meal. Uh, so it's indeed a very precious gift. Uh, that we get to receive and share with one another in a few moments. Uh, we're going to begin with a time of confession. So this is the time when uh, you will need a rock. And if you, so if you don't have one, there's uh, some on the table at the back. And what will be happening is the ushers will direct you in a few moments, not right now. Uh, and uh, they'll uh, invite you to come up. And what you can do is place your rock... Uh, either there or on the floor in front of the cross um, as, um, and the rock would represent our sin that we're going to leave our sin at the foot of the cross and leave it with Jesus and then uh, after that you can, if you want you can stop and just pray for a moment uh, before you do that or after uh, and then I'll invite you to come to the center part where I will be and I will uh, assure you of the forgiveness of your sins and uh, serve you with the, the bread wafers, the body of Christ. And then uh, Helmut will be over here, and uh, he will uh, offer you uh, the wine, the blood of Christ. And so the wine is uh, red liquid, and it's individual cups only. Uh, the, um, if you prefer a non-alcoholic um, fruit of the vine, uh, there will be white grape juice on the serving trays uh, that you can uh, uh, receive. And then afterwards, uh, there's a couple of empty baskets. You can place your empty, empty cups uh, over there. Uh, for uh, safety reasons, Helmut and I will uh, sanitize our hands. We'll be wearing masks as we do this. Uh, you, of course, don't need to wear masks, and it's kind of hard to eat and drink with them on anyway. So... Uh, this works out well. So I invite you, if you have a rock, to take it. Oop, i got to go get mine. And let's begin with a time of prayer. And after that, I'll speak the words of institution, and then uh, we'll begin our time of uh, movement. Dear Jesus, as we hold a rock in our hand, we think of the woman caught in adultery and how you were so gracious and forgiving toward her. There were people who wanted to throw rocks at her that day, yet none of them were without sin. It's the same with us. We have all sinned and fallen short of your divine standard of perfection, and we carry around the guilt shame and regret of bad things that we have said, thought, or done. Like the men around that woman, we fall short in being gracious and forgiving to others, and we tend to be quick to cast stones at other people. We even throw rocks at ourselves, condemning ourselves for things which you do not condemn us for. Dear Jesus, we thank you for going to the cross for us to suffer and die, to pay the full cost of forgiveness for all the sins in the whole world. You rose from the dead to defeat sin, death, and the grave. And in you we have life and love that nothing, not even death, can take away from us. O oh Lord, please help us to trust completely in your forgiveness and help us to make a clean break with our past leaving what is behind, 
Help us to grab hold of the bright future that you have for us as we journey together toward the redemption and renewal of all things. In your holy and precious name we ask this. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. At this time, I invite you to come forward at the direction of the ushers.
invite you to stand. And now may this true body and this true blood strengthen and preserve you in the one true faith unto life everlasting. Go in the peace and the joy of your salvation. And as our time of worshiping God together comes to an end and you go out into the world to share God's love with a broken and hurting world, go with this blessing. May you pursue Jesus with all your heart. May God use you to do mighty things for his kingdom. And after all is said and done in this world, may you hear God say to you, Well done, my good and faithful servant. And may the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you both now and forever. Amen. Join together in our last song. Blessings on your week, and trust God to take you safe to shore.